Good afternoon. This is Pastor Mark Creekmore, pastor at Bimini Baptist Church in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And we're going to dive right into our study in just a moment. But let me have prayer. And I'm going to read the text and jump right into the text tonight. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, some of you live, some of you a little bit later. But it is a blessing uh, to always have you watching. Let me pray now and we will get started. Lord Jesus, tonight we pray for this study. We pray that you will speak our hearts. Uh, we pray that you will give us Okay, I think I'm back um, and I just prayed. So let me dive into the text tonight. And uh, we'll uh, jump into this Bible study. Uh, the Bible says in James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, My brothers, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his life from death and cover a multitude of sins. Let me pray, and then we'll start. Lord Jesus, speak to us tonight. Get me out of the way. May Jesus be high and lifted in this text. We love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The sheriff called, a, uh, called it nothing short of a miracle. Leah and Caroline Carico had been found in the woods 44 hours after they took the wrong trail and got lost. Over 250 people descended on the remote and heavily wooded region near their home in Northern California. Leah was eight years old and five-year-old Caroline were found a little over a mile from their home, hunkered down under a huckleberry bush. The girls said that they had been following a deer trail when they got lost and decided to stay put. They survived by drinking fresh water from leaves. Leah described the long wait for rescue this way. My sister cried the whole night and I told her to keep happy thoughts of our family. Caroline slept little and kept watch on both nights that they were missing. The search team included law enforcement and military personnel using track sensing dogs and helicopters to search the rugged terrain. They found footprints that eventually led them to the girls. After 44 hours, Leah and Caroline were found safe and sound and returned to their parents. Describing the danger the girls were in, one official said this, an eight and a five-year-old were by themselves in the woods in the middle of cougar country with bears and everything. We were stressed, we were concerned, and, and, and the article goes on. It's so easy to see how it happened. The girls took the wrong trail and got lost. Thankfully, they were found in time, and a story that could have resulted in tragedy instead ended with a happy ending. It's easy for us, any of us, to end up on the wrong trail in life. Sometimes it happens by accident, and sometimes we make foolish decisions that lead to a disastrous place. When we wander off the path, will anyone come after us? If they do, will they get to us in time? James is thinking about these questions as he comes to the end of his epistle. His letter seems to end abruptly. There are no final words of love no fond farewells, no encouragements, no comments, instead a challenge and a promise, but also it begins with a warning. 
Let's pay close attention to his words because one day we may find ourselves far off the trail and we may need someone to come for us. Or our Christian friends may wander away and will we care enough to go after them? And so what I want us to do tonight is I want us to look at the warning, the challenge, and the promise that James pins in this letter. The first thing that we look at is the danger that is described. My brothers, if any among you strays from the truth, first, this is a warning to Christians. James writes to my brothers referring to fellow believers. He uses the term brothers 15 times in this epistle, and each time it refers to followers of Christ. Second, this is a warning to every Christian. He says, if anyone should stray, James is an aim in his words at uh, the subset of his readers. He means it for all of them, all of us, to take his words seriously. And then thirdly, this is a warning against straying from the truth. The Greek term is related to the English word planet. Just as the planets wander through the skies, believers may wander away from the truth. Some have suggested James is thinking about moral or ethical lapses in a believer's life and not about theological error. But I doubt that very seriously because the, those two things really can't be separated. Good theology ought to lead to good living. Bad theology opens the door for bad behavior. Perhaps the key word in all of this is strays, which sometimes is translated wanders or slips away or loses his way. Those word pictures suggest something that happens unintentionally, like the two girls who somehow got lost in the forest, the, the story that I told from the onset. When they left home, they intended to stay on the trail, but they took the wrong turn, went down the wrong path, and ended up lost. I've known people who drifted away from the faith, but I've never known anyone who did it intentionally. I mean, just, I set my mind, I'm going away from God, and God's not going to do anything about it. It's hard to imagine someone waking up and saying, today, I'm going to ruin my life. Perhaps there are people like that, but those folks are not in view in this verse. James is thinking about brothers and sisters who once fellowship with us around the Lord's table, but something happened, and now they are gone. They have wandered away. They have strayed away. They have gotten outside of what they once knew. Not only are they not in the church, they're not in anyone's church, not just the church we go to, but they're not in anyone's church. They wandered off the path of Christian fellowship. This could happen to any of us. That's what James is saying. As a familiar hymn goes, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Sometimes people drift away because of disappointment with God. Very often, uh, the biggest barrier to faith is life itself. People may give up on God because they feel as though he has wounded them and can no longer be trusted. When you pray for uh, your marriage to be saved, only to watch your husband leave you for a younger woman, that can cause you to question everything you believe. The same thing can happen when a child dies, or when you face false accusations, or when you lose anything that you own, because life can be terribly hard. 
let me say that again, life can be terribly hard. <clears throat> we shouldn't be surprised when people can't put a happy face on and come to church with us on Sunday morning. I, I do not say that to justify anything. I'm not justifying what I'm saying tonight, only to observe that these things happen in life. And sometimes they happen to people we call good Christians. <clears throat> I want you to hear that. Sometimes they happen to the best of us. Galatians 6, 1 offers another scenario. It says, if anyone is caught in any wrongdoing, the word caught was used for a bird or animal caught in a trap. It describes a believer has been suddenly overcome by some temptation. People, uh, Peter offers a perfect example. After boasting he would never desert the Lord, he ended up denying him three times. This verse pictures a believer whose leg is caught in the trap of sin. The bone is broken and the person has no hope of escape. What will you do when you hear your brother crying for help? Will you walk away or will you try to help? And that's what James is driving home in this text tonight. Let me make a ported application. We are all just one stupid mistake away from ruin, uh, ruining our lives. It doesn't take much. One phone call, one email, one foolish comment, one reckless action, one thoughtless deed, one dumb mistake, one angry reaction. We've all been there, haven't we? We've said something. We've did something. We went somewhere. We had no business going. We replied to a text we should have ignored. Uh, we got into a fight with someone who fights better than we do. On and on the list goes. Don't think this verse doesn't apply to you. Our worst mistake would be reading this text and saying, oh, I know who James is talking about. Don't be so sure, my friend. Before you point your finger, look in the mirror. He might be talking about you. He might be talking about me. I read this story some time ago about a beloved Bible teacher near the end of his life. Uh, Dr. Strauss asked Harry to pray that he might finish well because he had seen so many men make shipwreck of their ministry through foolish choices. When Harry asked if he had anything specific in mind, Dr. Strauss said no, but he was thinking of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11 where it says, whoever thinks he stands must be careful lest he fall. Let me read that again. Whoever thinks he stands must be careful lest he fall. Dr. Strauss commented that only those who are standing can fall. That's why he asked for prayer. I commend that attitude to you, and I commend it to myself. We need to take these warnings seriously. We need to take Brother James very, very seriously at his word tonight. Before we move on, we ought to ask ourselves how we respond when we see a brother or sister wandering away from the truth. Are we glad? Do we gloat? Or are we, do we care enough to get involved? Perhaps the real danger is being so busy that we don't even see our brother or sister wandering away. One day we turn around and they are nowhere to be found. What happened? No one seems to know. We, uh, we kind of uh, drop our shoulders and go back to our own business. But James, my friend, is issuing this warning. And I want to encourage you tonight to take this warning in serious fashion. James has something else in mind. Not only the warning, but he also talks about the rescue. 
Uh, notice what the Bible says in the second part of verse 19, and someone turns him back. The phrase turns him back is sometimes translated convert. It has the idea of seeing someone speeding down a dark road at night. They are heading for their own destruction because they don't know that the bridge is out up above them. Inside the car, people laughing and talking and playing music, little knowingly that they will soon be dead. But you know, so you set up a roadblock, you flash your lights, you stand in the way, and, and you stop them before they get to the bridge that is out. You scream, you shout, you wave your arms, you do whatever you can because you're standing between them and death, will they stop? No one knows if they will stop. Perhaps they won't even see you or perhaps they will think that you're some nut in the darkness and go speeding by. But if you can get them to stop and listen, perhaps you can turn them around. If you do, you've saved them from death. That's what James is talking about when we turn a brother or sister around. Who is qualified to do this? James uses two very general terms to describe those who wander away and those who bring them back. He says, if anyone strays and someone bring them back, anyone can stray and anyone can bring the stray back home. Let me say that again. Anyone can stray and anyone can bring the stray back home. He doesn't limit this to the pastor or the elders or the deacons or the church leaders. The ministry of search and rescue belongs to the whole body of Christ. <laughs> there are some people the pastor can't reach. There are other people the elders can't reach. There are others that the deacons can't reach or some leader can't reach. This is a job for every believer, if you belong to Jesus, you are a member of God's search and rescue team. It's for everyone, every person. We must go to them because they have gotten lost and followed the wrong trail, and they will not find their way back on their own. Have you ever tried to stop someone um, that you love from doing something really stupid. Have you ever done that? I have, and probably you have too. It may have been a foolish choice, a dumb business move, or it might have been a relationship that was obviously bad for them. Perhaps you saw a friend uh, starting to be unfaithful in marriage, or perhaps a person wanted a divorce for a trivial reason, or you could see them slipping into alcohol and drug abuse, or you realize their anger was out of control. Whatever it was, you tried to step in, and you tried to help them to see the light. You wanted uh, to save them from making a terrible mistake. To make matters worse, you could see it, but they couldn't. You could see it, but they couldn't. No matter how much you talked and how much you pleaded and how much you argued and how much you yelled and how much you reasoned with them, they just couldn't get it. They just couldn't get it. I suppose all of us have been there. Get out of my life. They respond with a conversation like this. Get out of my life. I'm only trying to help you. If you want to help me, leave me alone. I'm your friend. Uh, you're no friend if you act like that. What do you do when people you love reject your advice and get angry when you try to talk to them? If you say nothing, things will get worse. But if you say something, things may get worse anyway. In that situation, it's easy. Let me say something from my heart. It's easy to write people off. Go ahead, be a fool. Jump off that cliff. See if I care. I warn you, I hope 
You hit the bottom hard so it knocks some sense into your head. You say that because then you shake the dust off your feet and you move on down the road. I'm only pointing that out because it's not easy. It's not easy, my friend, to do what James is asking us to do. He is not suggesting our efforts will always be crowned with success. Not everyone will love us when we try to turn them back to the truth. But that is not the issue in this passage. The question is, will we care enough to get involved? When Jesus spoke to Peter in the upper room, he predicted both his coming fall and his eventual restoration. Here's what he said, Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to uh, sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Pay attention to the words when you have turned back. It's the same verb found in James 5.19. The King James Version says, but when you're converted, some people have uh, stumbled over that statement, but I think it is very accurate. It is possible to be an unconverted. I want you to hear me, an unconverted Christian. I didn't say unsaved. I said unconverted Peter was saved, but in some deep sense, he was yet to be fully converted to the master's use. And that explains his tragic failure. True believers may stray far from the Lord, and when they do, they need to be turned back. Converted to the Lord. That's the meaning of James 5.19. They need to be turned back to the Lord. They need to come home. They need to come back uh, to where uh, where they, they, they sense the presence of the Lord. And so we see a rescue. We see not only a rescue, we see in the first place a warning. But then we go to verse number 20, and I'm going to finish up with verse number 20 tonight. Uh, I see a pardon promised. This verse contains a lot of good news. Let me read that verse one more time. Let him that whoever turns a sinner from the air of his way will save his life from death and cover a multitude of sins. This verse contains a lot of good news. James wants us to know that by God's grace, we can turn a sinner from the air of of his way. We can help our brothers and sisters get right with God, and we can bring them back to the Lord when they stray. When we bring a believer back to the Lord, we save their life from death. The word death stands for literal physical death, and it stands for all the ugly consequences of remaining in sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's always true. By bringing them back to the Lord, we save them from an early funeral. We save them from a premature death. Finally, we cover a multitude of sins. Here is the best news of all. The image of covering sin looks back to the Day of Atonement which the Jewish readers in the first century would certainly understand. To atone means to cover so that the sins are gone forever. When sin is covered, all guilt is gone. Praise God to God be the glory. Aren't you glad for the grace of God? I have talked to people who thought their sin was so horrible that God could never forgive it. In those moments when guilt overwhelms us, we must decide what we believe about Jesus and his death on the cross. You see, Jesus cried from the cross, it is finished. Did he mean it? Absolutely he meant it. Is his blood enough to cover 
all your sins? Absolutely. I love the words of Corey Tim Boom. Here, here's what she said. There is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. Let me repeat that again. It's worth repeating. There is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. We can say to our straying friends, if you come back, all will be forgiven. All your sins will be covered by the blood of Jesus and you will be completely restored. Tonight, as we wrap up this text, I want to think about those two little girls that I opened with tonight. They were lost in the woods for 44 hours. The rescue team spent hundreds of hours looking for them. They searched in all directions, followed every clue, but they never gave up. What the sheriff called a miracle was the result of a vast number of people working together side by side with the same goal in mind to find those little girls and bring them back alive. That was the whole goal of the rescue mission. They had no guarantee. They did not know if they would be found. They did not know what condition they would be in if they were found. The story could have, could have had a different ending. But hundreds of people went out searching, and they never gave up. They believed it was worth the time. They believed that it was worth the money. They believed that it was worth the effort. In the end, they were rewarded when they found those little girls safe and sound. What the rescue workers did for the little girls, we must do for each other. We must not say it doesn't matter or someone else will do it or they deserve what they get. If we love our brothers and sisters who go astray, we must go after them in the name of the Lord. There are no guarantees about how they will respond. We don't know how they'll respond. But if we don't go, how will they ever find their way back to the Lord? We come again and again to moments of decision where we must decide whether to get personally involved. The Bible says in John 15, greater love has no one than this that he laid down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did when he died on the cross, paying the price for our sins, taking death that we should have taken, we should have died, turning away God's wrath, setting us free, and giving us eternal life. There is no greater love than this. If Jesus left heaven for us, can we not leave our comfort zone to reach out to those who have gone astray? Let me ask the Lord Jesus tonight to forgive us for our callous indifferences to the hurting people that we see every day. Make us burden bearers who are not ashamed to help those who struggle under a heavy load. Help us to reach out to those who have gone astray that we might win them back to the Lord, that they might come home and they might come back to God. You see, that's what James is talking about. Going after those who have strayed. Going after those who have strayed from the truth. Wounded brothers and sisters in Christ. And we love them. And because we love them, we go after them. To God be the glory. Let me encourage you today. Someone has come, into, has come into your mind. You're thinking of someone right now that you need to go after. You might say, well, Pastor Mike, suppose uh, they don't respond in a proper manner. Well, if you don't go after them, it's going to get worse for them. 
Take that chance. Take that risk. And let's go after those who have strayed. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, tonight, we pray that you will help us to go after those who have strayed, those who have wandered away. Lord, uh, help us to show them we care, we love them, and as a result, we want them to come back where they can have the most joy and be the happiest. Lord, help us to do that. Uh, Lord, I pray for Linwood Harper. Thank you that he's home from the hospital. We praise God for that. Uh, we continue to pray for an unspoken request today that Harry Regis sent me, Harry and Terry. Uh, we pray for that need today. And also, uh, we lift up uh, Miss Alice, uh, who is hasn't felt well. We pray for her. And also Muriel, who hasn't felt well. We pray for her. And Lord, we got a long list um, of people. I know uh, Chuck and Joanne, we continue to lift them up and pray for them. Uh, also, uh, Brother Leon and Patsy, we pray for them. Pat and Ray Harper, uh, we pray for them and lift them up. And uh, also Shirley's sisters, uh, Brenda and Denise, and uh, we pray for them. And uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, Vesta today was sharing that they've got an anniversary, her and Bill coming up, uh, 46 years to God be the glory. And we uh, pray for them that they'll have a good anniversary. Lord, uh, we love you. We praise you. We lift Jesus and thank you for this text. What a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next Wednesday night, I don't know if it's going to be one more Wednesday night or uh, I've got so much material, it may be two Wednesday nights, uh, but I'm going to talk about how to pray for the sick, how to pray for the sick, and I'm taking it right out of the book of James, uh, this fifth chapter, and we're going to talk about praying for the sick, and I know we're going to do that next Wednesday, uh, perhaps it will take two weeks to get through that material, and then we will journey to a brand new study. God bless you. It's a blessing when you tune in. Love you. Praying for you. Have a great Wednesday evening.